Hello, my name is Kevin Martin and welcome to our next episode of Between the Vines. I'm here with the Lake Erie Regional Grape Program team members, Andy Musa and Jennifer Phillips Russo. Happy to bring you uh, our weekly update and um, wanted to give these guys a chance to introduce themselves. I'm actually going to talk about um, 250F of New York State Ag and Market Law today. It'll be a little more interesting than that, I promise, but you'll have to stick around and find out. Jen? Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. So uh, I know, <clears throat> excuse me, I know what's on everybody's mind and is, did we call Verasion yet for Concord? And the answer is no, unfortunately not. I know we were anticipating it happening around the 17th. Today is August 18th. Unfortunately, this wet weather we've been having has slowed things down. So historical data has well, you can look at the historical data and note that if we have hot, dry summers, it can move Verasion earlier, but it is not this year. That's not the case. Not that it's not been hot, but it's definitely been wet. So still waiting to call that. If you're looking out in your own vineyards, know that it is 5% purple in the majority of your grapes. That does not mean just the ones at the top. You have to look, lift up the canopy, look down below. You need 5% purple in order to call it for your own farm. Andy, did you have anything that you wanted to talk about? Well, I was in the vineyards again, beginning of this week. Um, and pretty much what we've been saying over the last couple of weeks. Um, things are pretty much the same. We... Uh, I was still finding some eggs in uh, severe risk sites, uh, some egg laying. And I guess that's not unexpected because, you know, as you get this late in the season, uh, third generation, uh, you did, do get extended egg laying. Uh, but we are, you know, way past the 17, 10, 17, 20 um, growing degree days. Uh, so, and that's, sort of what the model says to, you know, between the 1621 and 1710, uh, if you're gonna be putting on a contact uh, insecticide. So I, I think, like I said, there's some egg laying going on later than the model is saying, but if you read, really look at the model, what they're concentrating on is probably the, the majority of egg laying, I would say. So um, would be between that point, but growers should know that there is some extended egg laying going on, but the sites that I'm looking at are severe and high risk. So you would expect, because of, of the pressure is higher, the population levels are higher. Um, so I wouldn't expect you'd see too much of that in these low to moderate risk vineyards. Uh, so, are we going to get a uh, partial fourth generation? Uh, at some of the newest sites that were close to reaching 1620 around August 5th, we had a few, quite a, not quite a few, but there were enough that um, uh, they reached that 1620 maybe a couple of days past that August 5th. So on those sites, you know, uh, they may may potentially have a partial fourth generation. So just you know keep that in mind uh, and keep going out and scouting. The only other thing I'd say is, again, we've been talking about this the last few weeks uh, with all this rain now. Uh, again, if you have susceptible varieties for downy mildew, then make sure you keep scouting those uh, blocks with those varieties. Uh, I'm still picking some up in Delaware. Uh, I have not picked up any downy mildew in Niagara's or Concord's, or though we are getting some growers saying that they have in Niagara and Catawba's. So any yeah. of your susceptible varieties, um, like the Catawba, Niagara, uh, or your wine varieties, really just keep scouting those. Because with this weather, uh, it, it's prime for, uh, downy mildew getting a foothold in the vineyard. Uh, the only other thing as far as insects would be, um, again, and this isn't widespread, but 
again, certain blocks, I've seen uh, some buildup of uh, grape leafhopper. So again, it's not widespread, it's here and there sporadic, but just, you know, keep an eye out on that. And especially if you had a, you've had a history of, of grape leafhopper um, populations uh, in your different vineyard blocks. And we have, we have had the warmer weather where we would have expected some of this uh, leafhopper population to build. So just keep an eye on that too. Other than that, I think we're good. So Andy, um, I, you know, I don't think it's a lot of acreage, but we would be tomorrow, we would be two weeks out of August 5th. So for some of those sites that maybe had um, a third generation on August 5th or 6th, would it be time to at least spot spray or scout or what would you, what would you suggest doing in a year like this? <laughs> That's that's tough because it, it's easy if you know we the the warm temperatures would have kept up and we would have had a lot of those stations reaching the 1620 before August 5th. Then what I would say is, you know, and what the model says is that really if that happens, that you're going to have this fourth generation and you should keep continual coverage on your uh, on your clusters in those severe and high risk sites. So now growers don't generally listen to that, at least in Concords, they don't um, historically listen to that. But that that's what I would say. In a season like this, we're at the border. Um, I, don't, I don't know, to tell you the truth. I really don't know. Um, generally, we would have it, it's about 30 days, again, depending on temperature, but roughly about 30 days between the generations. So the beginning of September would be, you know, when they would start egg laying again, if we had that fourth generation. But in some of these areas, like I said, with this extended egg laying, it's still going on. So, and that might bleed into for another week, say, and then you're, you might get a fourth generation of egg lay. So the overlap in these areas with these high pressure is really tough to predict. And like the model does say, you know, once you get late in the season, the model isn't really a good predictor of, you know, once you hit that in seasons like this. So it would be, I guess, up to a grower if, if they would put another spray on uh, or not. Or, you know, either now or, you know, maybe the first week in September. Well, let me throw that into Kevin's court for a minute. If they were to put another spray on because they do have a record high crop or, you know, they're saying there's a big crop out there. What would it, how would that work out as a business decision? Yay or nay? It's, the, I mean, that's a really easy question to answer in an unhelpful way because Andy said, I don't know. So I get to say, I don't know. And, and because if you don't impact yield, if, if the spray is not effective, then the answer would be that you wasted money on that spray. And I would imagine, despite the fact that when we're going to get into prices in a minute here, despite the fact that prices are, are healthy, um, you know, even sprays this time of year in general often don't impact um, your bottom line in a positive way. So, you know, powdery mildew sprays or, or downy mildew sprays in Concord this time of year are probably not going to do anything, even though um, we do see prices that, that would argue that doing lots of things are justified, uh, only doing things that are actually helpful pay. So, you know, if you, if you don't get any extra control of your berry moth, then, then there wouldn't be any economic reason to do it. Uh, but, and yeah. that, like you said, Kevin, that, that's a tough thing for me to, you know, sort of guess on because I don't know. Um, again, it, it may definitely help if you have, you know, this high egg laying in sort of these severe risk sites. And in that situation, you know, I might put one on, but like you said, only spot spray. You know, right. I wouldn't go out now and 
you know, spray your whole block. But the problem with that is, you know, if you have rows that are parallel to the woods, that's easy. That's an easy decision. And you're, and you're not using, even if it doesn't work, you're not using that much, wasting that much money because it's a, it's small areas. Whereas if you got to spray your whole block and these rows are, are perpendicular to the woods, guys are not going to back out, you know, or, or shut their sprayers off once they get so many post links into the vineyard, they're going to spray the whole thing. So, uh, it, it's, I yeah. can't give an answer to that. I really can't. Um, I would say though, it's, it's the vineyards that have really had a history of berry moth that you're really going to see the biggest. Um, where you would even consider it. Yes. Right. And, and where you, even if they are egg laying, where you'd have the, um, the most effect. I don't, I don't see in these low and moderate risk vineyards this year that we're going to have, you know, this catastrophic berry moth problem. Yeah. And it's uh, August 18th today. Wouldn't surprise me if some very small acreage had already been harvested. Um, certainly by the 23rd next Monday, harvesters will be going in a bulk commercial sense, um, you know, full truckloads, not a, a ton here and there for a small winery. So that does increase the cost of spraying. Um, you, you have to pay attention to your pre-harvest intervals. Uh, other processors might be starting as early as the 6th. So anything with a pre-harvest interval of less than 21 days has to be considered. Um, setup and teardown time for getting ready to spray is now something that becomes a consideration. So even if you're only spraying five acres, your sprayer may be, you know, that may be a half day project for you at this point. So I, I certainly could understand some he hesitancy to avoiding a spray right now. Uh, so I, I do think it's a di definitely a difficult question. Uh, but if, if it is going to result in crop loss, it is something that needs to be considered. And I don't think we have a great answer as to whether or not it would. You know, well, you along those out. same lines, Kevin, I, I, I kind of agree I, where you brought up about even putting on something for powdery mildew at this point. Um, right. I was talking to Brian Head, uh, who's a pathologist at the Grape Lab in Northeast, just the other day, and we sort of discussed this. And it's, you're almost at the point now where, again, is this spray going to really do anything or enough to justify? And, and we really don't know, but at least in Concords, I'm talking about, um, I would say, again, it's a toss up. Um, probably not, probably not. Um, it won't hurt. But I'm not sure, and I can't give you an answer economically, whether doing that would give you enough economic payback. I mean, the biggest thing right now is what we need is, and the thing that's going to make the biggest difference uh, is just good weather from abrasion to harvest. I mean, that's what we need. And that's going to be the, it doesn't matter about sprays. Now, when we're talking about diseases and powder, that's what we need to get the, the crop right uh, on these, on these uh, heavy crops. So uh, again, it's a toss up, like you said, economically, whether or not at this point, another spray is gonna help. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would like to add though, it's a different story in wine grapes. We're talking concords here. So, you know, for wine grapes, you're gonna have in these tight cluster varieties, you're gonna have to worry about, um, you know, sour rot problems or just general bunch rot problems. So, oh, sure. That's a different story. But as far as Concords, um, you know, uh, I, I think most of the guys are pretty much done unless, like you said, with the Burry Mall situation, but I can't give you a definitive answer on that. I really can't. Yeah. I mean, for our growers that have late season wine grapes or, you know, late September or late October, whichever. I, I would imagine that their ability to spray for Berry Moth and Concords right now would be a much simpler thing to, to a much simpler sort of analysis for them. Uh, you know, if they, if they're concerned, if you're in that group and you're concerned about it, you're probably ready to go in terms of a sprayer. You're just trying to justify the actual cost because we know you're probably going to continue spraying for a while. A lot of our growers, um, you know, that focus primarily on natives though, or natives plus 
some of the early season hybrids that they're going to be well past what they would typically consider their spray season and getting ready for harvest already. Um, so just so everybody out there knows, listening to this podcast, I, I had the most to say. Andy joined us, even though he didn't have anything to talk about. <laughs> and I I'm haven't even started yet. <laughs> oh, I think it was all really helpful. I actually made Andy join us because I knew we would have some helpful information, even though he thought he didn't have anything to say. I'm going um, to be quiet if you're on it. Thank you for so, the invitation. So, so I had... um. I had mentioned we were going to talk about 250F today. And if you don't know what 250F is, uh, for for our producers of or processors of grapes, they need to state a grape price. That's a little misleading. I wish they needed to state a grape price. That would be great for me. By August 15th, what they actually need to do is inform their growers that they buy from by August 15th what they will be paid. Um, they can do that before August 15th. They just can't do it after August 15th. One, one minor exception and one gigantic exception, uh, cooperatives are exempt from this for the most part, unless cooperatives are participating in the cash market. So, you know, buying things from non-members. Um, also, uh, if you're buying very small amounts, you may be exempt. If you're buying less than 20 tons of a single variety and less than five tons from a single grower, you can negotiate a price at a later date. Um, you, you can probably also do that um, if it's less than five tons for a, you know, you could pay a premium for it if, if you have some unexpected quality surplus. So like you, you get, you, you're going after some Riesling, a four ton of Riesling and you wanna pay a premium for it. You can do that later than August 15th but you're limited in those quantities. So you do wanna make these announcements um, and you can make them as complicated as you want. We, we used to have processors pay a premium for higher bricks and, and they would have a brick schedule in their price announcement. So you would know, uh, you know that your price would change based on that. And I'm bearing the lead here. If you'd asked me last year, who pays, you know, what's the highest average Concord price? What's, it, what's the highest it has ever been? Um, I would, I would really have to go look at the data to say not $300 because I don't think we ever had an average price in excess of $300. The lowest price I've seen so far this year is $280. It's a fairly small player in the market. I think we're gonna average more than $350 a ton. In the cash market, we're gonna average right around 330, um, give or take. Very few processors are paying on Bricks this year, a couple that want to are not able to get inspectors. Others are not interested. And um, are there is a bricks differential at one of the major processors, but it's very, very slight. So I wouldn't consider it, um, would not consider it. I think I've got it written down here somewhere. I think it goes from $350 a ton for their low brick stuff up to 375, I wanna say, or 360, no, 367 for their high bricks. So very, very slight differences. But, um, you know, $20 a ton extra does seem like a lot, or it used to when we were getting paid $250 a ton. Uh, it seems very slight now that we are, you know, we're approaching a, a $400 market in some of the markets. What kind um, of the uh, differences in bricks there? Like, so very high bricks. So that particular one, you were seeing one point changes in bricks, not tenths, a whole point. Um, minimum bricks tend to be around 14.5 or 15. There are very few exceptions to that other than um, some of the wine grape markets, which are not necessarily paying on a differential yet, but are looking to do that in the future. So um, they will actually have standards lower than that, I would guess, because they're looking for things like color, which develop below 15 bricks and um, are, are receiving grapes occasionally that don't have color yet. And that happens before 15 bricks. Um, there is a sort of a wide differential in terms of what, what is being paid. So it's probably gonna vary from 280 to $375 a ton or 380 a ton. Um, so that's about $100 different. There will be very few grapes on the low end 
you know, if you look at the number of tons that are going to get less than 300, it will be very close to zero or, you know, somewhere around 100 ton total. Um, the, the cooperatives are very healthy now. That's what's driving these prices up. It is not bulk juice prices. Bulk juice prices are great, but they've been better in the past. The difference here is um, the, you know, the elephant in the room is national grape and they are paying and have paid more over the last year than they have in the past. Their, their finances, I would imagine, you know, from what I've seen of them are healthier, but they've been able to um, pay a, a premium. So now everybody's fighting for what's left over and there's not much left over. Um, but we have seen higher bulk prices than this. So th this is not the ceiling on what can be done with the price of grape juice. Um, I don't well, that's know if fantastic news. <laughs> well, I don't know if we'll see higher prices. I would just say, you know, last time we went through this cycle, the peak of the cycle was higher grape prices than this on the bulk side uh, for 68 bricks concentrate. So I don't know where prices are going. If I had that crystal ball, I certainly wouldn't be an extension agent. I could make <laughs> lots of money doing lots of other things. I don't have a crystal ball, so I'm an extension agent. And so I can't answer that question and nobody else can either. But um, this obviously creates some really nice options for growers in the future in terms of reinvesting in their acreage. Hopefully they already started that process. There have been lots of hints of pri higher prices. Prices were not bad last year other than by comparing it to this year, prices looked pretty awful last year, but but they were good. I mean, I think growers are making some, a lot of growers were, made money last year, uh, as long as there wasn't a, you know, a disaster on their individual farm. So, so we can see some investments here. Uh, we don't have to talk about whether or not a grower can afford a berry moth spray next year. We, we only need to talk about whether or not that berry moth spray is a good investment. And and the list sort of goes on from there. That's not the only thing. But um, prices of native grapes other than Concord are not necessarily down, but particularly relative to Concord, they're not good. Um, you know, you're not happy to be growing whites natives right now. Uh, even Niagara um, is really not in demand or in favor right now. Prices are good. I haven't seen anything less than $250 a ton. I, I think the lowest I've seen is 275 for for any of these natives. But typically, you know, if you're growing something like Delaware or even Catawba, you would hope for a premium, but certainly Delaware and Elvira because it costs more to grow those things. But there's no premium right now because we have a surplus of whites um, and we have a surplus of some of those other natives as well. We don't have a surplus of of Concords. Uh, Concords are expensive enough, so it probably kind of seems a little crummy to be in the market for some of the more expensive hybrids. Uh, those prices have not changed too much. Um, I, I don't want to go through a list of all of them because they're all priced differently. But, uh, you know, we see those typically fall in a range of $300 to $800 a ton, with most of them falling in, in the $400 to $600 range. And that's where they are right now, for the most part. So great prices for them. You can make money growing those things at $600 a ton and even at four, depending on what it is. Um, I said great prices. I shouldn't say great. They're, they're good. They're okay. They have, none of those markets are falling apart right now. Um, but you know, relative to a Concord grower that is hoping potentially from a cooperative to receive um, you know, great prices close to $400 a ton is their hope. Um, I don't know that I would expect that or promise it to anybody, but that makes those hybrid prices seem a little less favorable. So I don't, I don't anticipate a lot of hybrid plantings in the future. Um, you know, Vincent Ives and the, the recently planted stuff like Aurora, those are all doing okay. It, even relative to Concord, I think they're doing okay. And that's what you'll see, um, you know, if you're fortunate enough to be growing a hybrid that's just as easy to grow or close to it. As Concord, I think you're going to be you're going to be happy. Um, the but again, the big exception here is with with cooperatives. With cooperatives, we're really forecasting and guessing at prices. Still, they'll pay what they can pay, um, but they don't announce a price. And uh, wineries buying juice in, or grapes in PA don't announce a price either. They don't have to. This is a New York State law, so 
So there's, there is certainly still some outstanding data that we don't know the answer to it. And, uh, but, you know, everything seems okay right now. So it seems like all of those prices will be very good. That's all we know right now. Hopefully that doesn't change. Oh, good. <laughs> I don't get to say or make fun of you for being a little ray of sunshine because you are today. So thank you. <laughs> well, I just tell you what people tell me and that's what I've been told. So if somebody gives me some bad news, I'll let you know what it is. Um, but, you know, the one thing now is just hopefully everything gets ripe and, you know, nobody's going to realize these high prices if they don't have a crop. So that's unfortunate for people who have had a disaster and hopefully we don't have any more, um, whether that is, um, you know, I think that everybody's biggest concern now is making sure we get enough good weather to ripen everything. That's all. And so that's, that's back to you, Jen. Now we just need to dry out. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I'm hopeful that we don't even have to dry out. We just have to have something that's not reasonable that, you know, nothing that resembles hurricanes traveling through through the area. If we just have some seasonable weather, I think we'd be happy. I think we get it. Yeah, I was looking at the forecast actually, and looks like after today, there's a chance tomorrow we should dry out for the next week, or at least there's not a chance of rain as of today. So fingers crossed. It's raining right now. After today. <laughs> after oh, I thought you said there's not a chance today. <laughs> no, after today. <laughs> looking out the window yeah um i do think that's all we have for the week right um i hope that these podcasts get shorter and shorter because this is the time of year that we should have less content um hopefully we get a chance to invite some guest speakers on just to give you things to consider going forward in terms of changing your operation and more more uh you know for the past six months we've been really focused on this growing season and we don't want to cancel this podcast in the dormant season or during harvest. We'd like to give you an opportunity to hear from, you know, from some speakers and maybe even from us here and there about the bigger picture and not necessarily thinking about 2021, but just thinking about growing grapes in general and maybe doing it differently in the future. So we'll try to get our content there. And I hope you're listening to this on your phone and you can listen to it in your tractor. I know about half of you are. I know that because our reports tell us. So um, if you ever need any help with that, because the other half of you are going to the website and streaming it and sitting in front of your laptop, uh, you don't need to do that. And I know you're not going to do it during harvest. So if you ever want any help with that, because you're bored driving around in circles, we give it, reach out to us and we can help you with that. Um, yeah, start you, yeah um, go ahead. Starting next week, we are also going to be doing the Verasion to Harvest berry sampling and reporting on where things are in regards to sugars and berry weights. So, yeah, I'm not going to promise we're going to read that to you in this podcast, but we can give an <laughs> overview of that as well. So, if you uh, are driving around in circles and you can't read a newsletter, we can we can get you some of that information that way. So, um, but yes, if you do need help with that, or if you have questions, and suggestions for topics of upcoming podcasts, we'd be more than happy to hear from you. Uh, thank you all for joining us, and we will see you next week. Bye, everyone. Andy, wave for those of you listening. Yeah. <laughs>